this is such an important week. There's so much happening in this week. God is showing you so much in this week. He's revealing to you his powerful, magnificent love in this week. And yet the love that used to move you, the love that, that, that captured you, the, the love that that's all you, you just worshiped God because you realize how much you love. Now, now you've grown cold and it's just, oh yeah, 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 yeah. We talk about time. God loves you. God loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just want to help us. Like, can we this week posture our lives a little bit different and let's not allow the love of God to be something that we take for granted. The love of God will be something that we, we, we forget how magnificent it is. I just think we gotta take some time to intentionally stop this week and think this week and, and feel this week so we don't miss what God intends for us in this week. You see, and I want you to understand, listen, listen, there's absolutely nothing in all of time and eternity, there's absolutely nothing in all of history that is more significant than this that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I've been, I've been in ministry. I know some of you are gonna think like I'm lying to you because I only look like I'm 24 years old, but see, I've been in ministry since I was like 19. You do the math, full-time ministry at 19, and I'm now 41. No, 40, what am I, Tatum? I can't even remember. It's like 41, like 49, something like that, 48, 49. So that's a long time. So I've preached a lot of, I preached a lot of Palm Sunday messages. I preached a lot of, it's just, it's just fun. And I was getting everything ready, you know, like to, to do the triumphal entry of Jesus and, and that, that whole thing. How many, I mean, you got the kids come out and they wave the palm branches and all that. And how many have been in services like that? That's actually not a really good thing to wave palm branches. Do you know what was happening while they were doing this? Not me, I'm just gonna share it with you. Is that the, the palm branches was a sign of their national identity, okay? And so when they were waving the, the palm branch, it's like us waving an American flag. It's a sign of our national identity. And so they were saying, they're saying, here we come, Rome. We're gonna take you down, Rome. They were declaring war is what they were doing on war uh, on, on, on Palm Sunday, like expecting Jesus to overthrow the, the, the Roman government. But how many of you know that Jesus was actually not, not here the first time? He was not here to overthrow the, the temporal government. Oh, there's a message in this. Some of us need God. God, I just, this, this temporal thing and that thing. And God, if you would deal with that, then we'd be good. And in my life would be so much better if Rome was gone. We all have our own Romes. Jesus shows up and he goes to the temple and he doesn't overthrow Rome. He overthrows tables in the temple. And what he was doing is saying, listen, it, before we deal with everything out there, we got to deal with some stuff in here. You see, the, the temple, the temple was the center of Jewish life. And say, so we got to fix some stuff here first. So Jesus rides in to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and, and the cross is in view. Okay, this is Holy Week. And here's what it tells us in our portion of scripture today in the book of Romans. It tells us this. It says, you see, at just the right time, when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. How many of you know that, that Jesus riding in Jerusalem, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't just like, hey, let's make today the day. No, today was the day. Your Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Every day is the day the Lord has made. Amen? But that portion of Scripture is actually pointing to a very specific day that the Lord had made. And it was this day, the day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem on the temp, uh, uh, ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Um, is a day that was given us to the actual specific year, specific day in Daniel chapter nine. If those of you those of you who want to study the prophecy of Daniel nine, Daniel nine is pointing to the exact day that Jesus would come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. A donkey? Why a donkey? Like if you're riding, riding in to Jerusalem and it's the day that you're gonna like, like proclaim yourself king, like Jesus, you chose a Prius. I mean, like pick a, pick a Shelby, like a 69 Shelby or like a, come on, right? But Jesus was making sure that we didn't miss the fact that he was the Messiah because scripture would tell us that Jesus would come in riding on a donkey. And Jesus comes riding on a donkey, declaring himself to be the Messiah. And scripture says that it was all in the right time. This, there, how many of you know God, God works on a timetable? It's very, he, he you know, we're, we're, God, where are you? It's like, I'm, I, 
I got everything in its proper time. So just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But here's what scripture tells us, and here's what I want us to, but I'm praying just echoes in your heart this week. I want you to understand this as we move into this very important week in the life of Jesus and in the, the hallmark of our Christian faith. It's this, but God demonstrated his own love for us us in this, that while we were still sinners, when you were at your worst, Christ died for us. When you were at your worst, God gave his best. And friends, I'm telling you, the truth behind what scripture says is meant to absolutely shake you and shape you and change you. Because it's in this week that Jesus would do what he came to do, to give his life for you and for I, to rescue us because of his great love for us. In this is love. In this is love. In this is love. In this is love. That's powerful. Now, God would love you so much that he had sent Jesus at just the right time to give his life for you. And I just think, how, how many of you have heard the you've heard the the statement familiarity breeds contempt? Come on, you've heard that. Have four of you heard that? Can I get another hand? Anybody like you've heard that? So what are, what are we saying when we say that? We're, we're saying that when you've been around something a whole lot, it, it breeds this discon, disconnectedness. You, you disconnect from it. You don't you don't value it as much as you as you used. To. So so you get a new car. You remember you got your new car. It, maybe it wasn't brand new, but it was new to you, and it's your new car, and you get your new car, and it's like, I got a new car. And you just love your new car, and you, you wash your new car. You, 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 you got rules. You got rules about your new car, like where you park it at night. It's going to be in the garage. I'm parking it every night in the garage. I park it. You got rules, like you can't eat my new car. You're going to wash the new car. Some of you husbands, you go down, and you, you check on your new car in, at night just to make sure. Is it still there? It's still there. And it's still looking good. And you're cleaning your new car. This is attention on your new car. But, but familiarity breeds contempt. And pretty soon, week after week goes by, month after month goes by, and the car that you used to make sure you parked in the garage at night, you can't even remember where you parked it at night. You get, you get to bed and you're like, did I pull the car in the garage? Where did I? Eh. The car that you used to say, hey, no eating in my car is now the car that you store all of your, you know, extra Chick-fil-A sauce in. I know what you're putting all up inside your, your glove box. You see, you just start to, you just start to ease up. You, 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 you don't value it as much. You with me? It's the same thing, girls. I, I connect, you get your new outfit. Come on, you got, the, you got that new outfit, and, and you're all about your new outfit. Have you seen my new outfit? What's up, Instagram? Check out my outfit. Everything's about your outfit, and it's, a, it's like the thing, you know, and pretty soon weeks go by, months go by, and it's like, what outfit? I bought nine more since then, right? I'm over it. I used to steam it, send it to get dry cleaned, and now you got it laying on the floor in some bunch that you can't. Hey. I can't tell you how many times I bought myself a, a new pair of, of Air Force Ones, some, some white, just clean Air Force Ones. And I, I would tell myself every time I bought them, I'd say, this is the pair. This is the pair that I will keep clean. There will not be a crease in these shoes. That I, there will, there will, I'm, gonna, I'm not walking on dirt in these shoes. I'm going to keep these white shoes clean. You with me? I, got the, I bought a special. Come on, Tatum. T help me. I bought a special thing to help clean these shoes. I'm going to brush off these shoes. And I buy the shoes. And two, three weeks go by. Four weeks. I'm outside mowing the lawn in the shoes. <laughs> Familiarity. And, and, and we know that. We we. we you're with me. But here's what I'm so afraid of is that, is that you do that with spiritual things. You, you, do that with, you do that with God's love. You do that with, you do that with what this week means, what, with what Passion Week brings to you and I. This is such an important week. There's so much happening in this week. God is showing you so much in this week. He's revealing to you his 
powerful, magnificent love in this week. And yet the love that used to move you, the love that, that, that captured you, the, the love that, that's all you, you just worshiped God because you realized how much you, now, now you've grown cold. And it's just, oh yeah, 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 yeah. We talk about time. God loves you. God loves you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I just want to help us. Like, can we this week posture our lives a little bit different and let's not allow the love of God to be something that we take for granted. The love of God will be something that we, we, we forget how magnificent it is. I just think we got to take some time to intentionally stop this week and think this week and, and feel this week so we don't miss what God intends for us in this week. You see, and I wanted you to understand, listen, listen, there's absolutely nothing in all of time and eternity. There's absolutely nothing in all of history that is more significant than this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing more magnificent that God would demonstrate his own love for us. His love. His love. God demonstrates at the cross his love. You know, God could have in heaven just said, hey, church, I love you. you, you, you. Church, 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 I love you, you, you. This is God, God, very far away, way, way, way. And he could have done that. But no, God doesn't just go, I love you, you. He demonstrates. Hey, man, it's actually ladies in here. Listen, ladies, like, you got you got you got your man. Come on, girls, you got your man, right? You you don't want your man. Like, I mean, tell me you love me, great. Blah blah blah. Give me all the lip service, you know. But girl, come on, help me. Talk is, talk's cheap. Boys, listen to me. You tell her you love her all you want. Don't tell me. Come on, girls, help me out. Show me, Amen. right? Don't tell me. Show me. Hey, you can say it all you want, but listen, there better be some actions backing up them words. Because talk is cheap. Can I get a better amen, ladies? I feel like I'm preaching and helping you out. Better. So don't just tell me, show me. Don't tell. And here's the problem. Guys, can I, here's the problem for us guys is you girls have all these different, they call them love languages. Everyone's got a different love language. And so those guys are trying to figure out how to love on you. And so let me just help you out. Do the love language deal. Like, go take the test. Find out what, how, see, listen, we all give and receive love in different ways. And just find out what that is, all right? And, and so go figure that out. Some of you guys are going to find, your girl, come on, her, her love language is gifts. Can I tell you something? You are a lucky fool if your wife, your girl's thing, you could be off on some trip, just send her a gift. She, oh, he just loves me so much. I mean, come on, that's like cheating. That's like, that's not even, what? What, what about, what about um, uh, quality time? Give me a break. That is so easy. Like, she wants you to love, love her. Let's go spend some time with you, baby. Like, let's go catch a movie. Let's go hang out. Let's play. That is just easy. That's easy. You boys don't even know. <laughs> Do you know what my wife's love language is? It's called acts of service. <laughs> She's like, no, nope, you buy me all the gifts you want. You can spend time with me all you want. She goes, get your rear out there and do something. Like, you want to show me you love me? Why don't you do the dishes for once in a while? Hey, you want to show me you love me? Why don't you take out the trash every now and then? Why don't you finish the project you said you were going to fix three months ago? Baby, I told you three months ago I was on it. I'll get to it. See, this is, she just, show me, show me, show me. And I love the fact that God in heaven did not just say it. He showed it. He demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrates it. Like, in other words, you can't doubt it. There's a cross that stands on the timeline of humanity that forever declares, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you. After Jesus rides into Jerusalem on triumphal, uh, on the, at the triumphal entry on this day, Sunday, now in the shadow of the cross, he's spending some time with his disciples. And here's what it tells us in John chapter 13, verse 1. 
It says it was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come. There it is again. He's, he's operating life in this divine timeline. Matter of fact, they, they would come and try to take Jesus and make him king. Do you remember this in Scripture? Like Jesus, they would, they would try to force him to be king, and then Jesus would go all ninja and disappear because it was not yet his time. But now, Passion Week, it is the time, the appointed time. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, watch this, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Jesus in this week is showing you and I through the cross the full extent of his love. And I just think it'd make a whole lot of sense for you and I if Jesus in the cross is showing us the full extent of his love for you and I then to look at that cross and try to understand some things about God's love. Like I just think it'd be really important this week as Jesus is living in the shadow of the cross for you and I to fully understand the love of God shown to us at the cross. And I just have a couple things I need you to consider about what the cross teaches us concerning God's love. And here's the first thing I need you to write down about God's love that is seen and shown to us in the cross that Jesus is about to bear is that God's love is a love that pursues us. And write that down. God's love is a love that pursues us. You see, when, when, when man sinned, when we rebelled and we did our own thing, God could have very easily left us to ourselves to, to, to live with the penalty that we very much deserved. We rebelled against God. We therefore, the Bible says that Jesus said, that, or God said, in the moment that you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. It was a spiritual death that Adam and Eve uh, brought upon humanity. And then having been separated from God, he could have left him in that state for all eternity. He could have just said, well, you, you made your bed, now lie in it. You broke it. But that's not God. The moment that we fell out of that very thing that we crave, relationship with God, the moment we broke that, God said, I'm going to do something to fix that. That's the cross. God at the cross, what we see from the heart of God is a, is a God who's coming after you. A God who's in pursuit of you. A, a God who, who just says, I, I'm going to leave heaven and earth, sacrifice my life because I'm in love with, I'm in pursuit of, of humanity. I'm in pursuit of you. I'm in pursuit of you. I'm in pursuit of you. And the cross declares that we've got a God, a love from God that is in pursuit of us. See, some of you, and I, I really... For all of us, I think this is kind of hard to understand that God would pursue us. As a matter of fact, when you think about God pursuing you, you think he's got like the, like the, the spanking spoon out or something, and he's like chasing you around. The God, is, God is in pursuit of you because he wants to love on you, because he cares for you. And a lot of us think it's, a lot of us, for a lot of us, it's hard to understand the fact that God would, would pursue after us in his love, that God would, would, would love us because I mean, you come in here with a track record, right? You got a history. Remember, you got a long history. And, and the problem is that you've been conditioned, follow me here, you've been conditioned to a conditional love. You live in a world that is marked by conditional love. In other words, you, you are used to a love that loves you when, loves you if, loves you because. You, you're surrounded by examples of, I'll, I'll love you only when you, and I'll love you only if you. You see, it's a conditional love. And so you take this understanding of conditional love, and you try to force that understanding onto God's love, you see. And so, so here's, here's where we struggle is that in our world, I'll, I'll, I'll love you if you're funny and if you cook, I'll love you if you, and I love you when you, and I love you, and all of this. And here's what happens in our world, in, in the love that we know, is that we, in, in this context, is that we, we learn to start, we start to perform. We learn to perform, right? 
So I learn what I need to do and not do in order to get you to love me the way that I need to be loved and I want to be loved. I learned what to say and to not say. I learned how to act and to not act. And I learned to perform in order to get love. Come on, even Santa Claus, everybody. Have you been good? Because if not, you get a lump of coal. Like, it's like everything predicated on these poor children is, you mean, it's all based on me? You grew up like that. Like, it's all, it's all based on me. And so you figure out how to work within the system that says, if I do, I get. And in the wake of, of, of conditional love, where we're stuck in a world striving to be loved and, and striving to earn loved. We're doing this. We're doing that. We're, we're posting this. And if that doesn't work, I'll take it down and I'll post that. I just got to, I got to do, you see. I got to earn. I got to deserve. I got to, I got to get there. And, and then, and then God shows up with a cross and says, imagine a love. Imagine a love that, that's not predicated on you. That, that isn't based in you. That's not, that's not predicated on how you perform. Imagine a love that loves you, period. End of subject. Imagine a love that is relentless, unconditional. Imagine a love that doesn't give up, that doesn't quit. Ima Come on, church. Imagine a love that just loves you, period. Pursues you, not because you deserve it. Because it's just who he is. It's just what he does. He loves Imagine a love that wasn't waiting for you to perform or waiting for you to arrive at this place. A love you couldn't earn, but yet is unceasing, consistent, dependent, reliable. As the, as the waves continue to crash upon the, the, the sands of the, of the sea, so God's love is for you and me. It's just consistent. There's no stopping it. It's agape love, unconditional, relentless, unshakable. Like, that's what the cross is saying. Like, you're at your worst, and I'm at my best. It's, it's a love in pursuit. You see, no matter where you go, it's there. You cut left. Love of God is there. You're like, okay, cut right. Love of God is there. You know, Spurgeon, the old, the, old, the old preacher, used to say that the love of God is the hound of heaven. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? He, I'm telling you, he's got your scent. <laughs> you know, the love of God. You see, and I just, I just love that picture because it's like the hound of heaven. He's like, the love of God's like, oh, no, no, oh, don't, I, I know. Oh, you're going to sneak over there. Hey, you're going to fall again. Hey, you're going you're gonna to trip up again. Hey. <laughs> see, it's, it's the love of God. It's just committed to, dedicated. How many of you are grateful today that you got a love of God that you can't shake, that you can't run from? You can't, gosh, you're not getting away. You're not getting away. The cross forever says, the cross stands in the time of humanity and says to you and I, there's a God in heaven that's in pursuit of you. Starting at the cross and moving from the cross into every life, every arena. Jesus told his disciples sometimes, he said, they're on the way to Jerusalem and Typically, when they go to Jerusalem, they'd go around this area called some area. But Jesus said, we're going to go to some area today. And you're like, Jesus, why? He said, we must go. We must go. Why, why must you go to Samaria? Jesus, well, there's a woman who's at a well who's been looking for love in all the wrong places and finding love in too many faces. And we wrote a song about it. You thought it was, you thought, no, they stole that from Scripture. <laughs> And, and Jesus shows up to this woman, listen, who's been looking for love. But that, that girl had no, no clue that while she was looking for love, that love was looking for her. He said, we must go. We must go. And when, when, when she showed up to the, to the well that day, she probably thought it was coincidence that Jesus was there. But it was no coincidence. Jesus ordained it to be so. 
because he was in pursuit, you see. He was after her. We must go. Oh, you thought it was just coincidence you showed up to church today. Oh, you thought it was just coincidence you saw the invite on Instagram and your friend. Oh, you thought it was just coincidence that everywhere you go, God keeps putting Christians. You thought it was just, no, no, that's the <laughs> hound of heaven. In pursuit of you, hunting you down. Come on, somebody. There's a cross. There's a cross that declares to you that you are loved. You are loved. And he's in that love pursuing you. And you know what? The pursuit of God and his love, what it, what it does, and I want you to let this happen this week, is it changes every what could be ordinary moment into extraordinary moments. Because you see, it's in every moment that the creator of heaven and earth is pursuing me. He's coming to some area right now. Right now. What's he doing? He's just pressing into some area. Some area of your life, some area of your, of your thoughts, some area of your insecurities, some area, some area of, of where the enemy's been lying to you for a long time, some area. God, and God just keeps, he's just going to press into some area, some area, some area. You see, it turns every moment into a moment that is holy and a moment that is, that is significant because in this moment, God and his unwavering love is pressing in to me. Of oh, course, you don't know me. You're right, I don't know you. But I, don't, I don't have to know you to know the truth. See, because listen, I don't know you, but I know the love of God. I know the love that God has for you. I know the love of God that was demonstrated for you on a cross that says he's in pursuit of you. Don't cheapen his love by trying to base it on some, in something you bring to the table. Don't cheapen his love by trying to say it is, uh, uh, trying to make it be something that, that's predicated on something in you. Don't, don't cheapen his love into something that you earn or you deserve. or you don't, don't cheapen his love. Receive his love. Rest in his love. See, the cross reminds us that God's love is a love that pursues us. You ever hear people say, and I'll move on from this point. I've got two others that I'll go quickly on. You hear people say things like, like they're telling their testimony, and then I found God. You did what? Like God was lost. Like God's like, I don't know where I am. <laughs> Somebody help. And then I found God. He was hiding the whole time, right around the corner. I didn't even see him there. But there he was, found you, God. No, friends, you didn't find God. He's been haunting you down since the moment you started running. He's been on your town. Like God is not found by you. You stopped running. And he'd been there waiting for you the whole time. See, the cross, the cross, the cross. Reminds you now that you got a God who loves you so much. He pursues you. He pursues you. He pursues you. And the cross that reminds us that God and his love pursues us is also the same cross that reminds us that God and his love rescues us. I want you to write that down as your second point. I want you to think about this this week as we move through Passion Week is that what Jesus is moving toward here is a, is a love story rescue mission. So what it says in Galatians chapter 1 is this, that grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins too. Why did he give himself for our sins? Why the cross? What's he doing? He says he gave himself for our sins to, someone say rescue us. To rescue us. Get back to that. From this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What is, what is Jesus doing on the cross? He's in pursuit of us, but that he might rescue us. It says that Jesus on the cross gave his life to rescue us from this present evil age. Let, let me unpack this for you. The, the present evil age, what, what scripture here is painting the picture of is that there is this present evil age. It is a, 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 a 
flow in humanity. It is a, a current in humanity. You feel it? The current? There's this, there's this current humanity that's a, that this evil agent is pulling in one direction and it's headed toward the falls. It's like a, it's like a river that's raging toward a falls. It's a, there's a, ridger, a river that filled with people who are separated from God and will end up being separated from God for all eternity if it's not dealt with on this side of eternity. And we're all caught in the, caught in the torrent. We're all caught in this current and there's nothing we can do to get out. I mean, you've tried. You've swam to the edge. You've held on to the branches. You've, you've, and, but the current keeps pulling you back in. We cannot on our own get out of the current. Some, some people are in the current and they just, they're holding on to like these logs that come by and like, oh, nice and safe. Oh, it feels so good holding on to my religion and holding on to my philosophy and holding on to all these things that I've been reading and watching. And oh, and I, I'm, I'm just so, but you're still in the current. It's still headed toward the falls, you see. And, and, and it's a picture of humanity. It's just, just stuck. And a current. And it says what Jesus is doing on the cross is rescuing us from the current. In other words, the the word literally means to pluck you out. He just went, okay, come on, come here. Poop, gotcha. And one of you, come here, gotcha. It it literally means that he's, he's pulling you out of the current of society. He's pulling you out of that which you once were trapped in. You see, he's rescuing you and he's planting your feet on a firm foundation. He's saving you from that which you've been stuck in. You fell off the boat. You can't swim. And in jumps somebody to help you. You're, 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 you're out past the break, and you get caught in the undertow, and, and they come out there, the lifeguard, going to come out there to, to rescue you and to save you, because you can't do it on your own. They're going to pull you out, you see. They're going to they're gonna pluck you out, and, and some of you, are, you're kicking, and you're just squirming all over this guy who's trying to help you, this gal who's trying to help you. Some of you just giving, you, you're like giving a hard time, but he's going to rescue you. He's going to pull you out, you see. And here's my question for you, is, is why does he rescue us? If we get the airs on, please, somebody, I'm gonna, or bring me a hanky, one of the others, so I can't. Why does he rescue us? Why does he pluck us out? Why, why does he, a cross where Jesus gives his life for us so that we can be forgiven? It's because I... I, I did something? Is it because I, I, I deserve something? Is it because, did I, you know what I did in this whole, whole mess? The reason he rescues me is because I need help. I just need you to understand that. The reason someone jumps in to help somebody is because they're drowning. Jesus jumps in to help us because, okay, you don't deserve or earn it. The one qualification you bring to the table in order to be rescued is a need. What do I bring to the I just need, I need help. Come on, right? Like I just, so, okay. The, I think some, okay. Why does a fireman run into a house it's because the house is on fire and, and, and you can't put it out. What, what do I bring to the table in this whole thing? My house is on fire. I need some help. You see, that's, that's all I need. So you think, I need to do this and I need to do that. I need to, no, you just need to admit, I need help. You need to admit, I'm, I'm caught in this current. I'm, I'm, I'm headed toward destruction. I've been trying on my own. I'm holding on to things, but it, it just keeps pulling me. I need help. And all we have to do is say, help. And he jumps in to help to rescue us from this present evil age. Rescue us from our house that's on fire. Rescue us from the sea of our sin that we've been drowning in. He jumps in to rescue us. What the cross does is it rescues us. He rescues us because the love of God is a love that rescues us. It's a love 
that pursues us, a love that rescues us. And here's the last one. I want you to write this down. It's a love that holds us. That holds us. See, he rescues us, and then he carries us. That's what we see happening at the cross. It's God making a way through which he cannot just pursue us and save us, but then carry us and hold us. Look at what Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says. It says, being confident of this, being confident, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. See, he's begun a good work in you. And what scripture says is he's not going to give up on that work in you. He will be faithful to complete it. He will. Listen, he started it. You've been squirming in it. He started, but he says, if I've started it, I will finish it. And the cross just says to you and I, I love you, I'm going to rescue you, and I'm going to, come on, I'm going to hold you. I'm not going to stop pursuing you. I'm not going to stop rescuing you. I'm not going to stop. How many of you got some projects that you promised yourself you promised yourself, I'm going to get it done. This is the, you used to say, this is the week. Now you say, this is the year. This is the year. Come on, right? And, and, and so you know how humanity works, right? We got really good ideas. And, and we start all sorts of things. <laughs> Tatum, stop looking at me like that, baby. I, I feel you. Um, we had a, our house in Orange County. I, when we first bought it, I think we were in that house for, I guess, like five or six years or something like that. When we first bought it, I remember walking in and there was a, uh, between the, the living room and the kitchen, there was this uh, wall. And I'm like, you know what? We're going to get rid of that wall. We're going we're gonna to poke a hole like a, a, through it so that when you're in the living room, you can see into the kitchen. And then we're gonna, when we have people over and everything, it's be great because you'd be in the living room. You'd be like, hey, everybody in the kitchen. And they're in the kitchen. Hey, everybody. You don't have to look around the wall anymore and all this. We're just going to get rid of this wall. We're going we're gonna to do this whole thing. And so here's how passionate I got about getting rid of this wall is I took some of that blue painter's tape. You know what I'm talking about? That blue painter's tape. And I took that stuff and I, I framed out the hole that I was going to cut in the wall. I put it perfectly there. So when I walked in, I stepped back, I went, that's going to look great. That's where we're going to put that hole. And that painter's tape stayed there for about three or four years. And every time someone walked in, they'd say, hey, what's with the painter's tape? And I'd say, oh, well, there's a project we're going to get to. We're going to poke a hole. We're going to make, you're going to see. Like, oh, yeah, that would be great. I can see that. That painter's tape stayed there. You see, I began a good work, but I did not finish the good work. I began a good work. And the only reason that painter's tape came down is because we moved. (laughs) It's it's just, you're going to, we sold the house and the vision, everybody. (laughs) But God's not like that. God says, I started the work. I'm going to see it through to completion. I started working in you. I'm not going to stop working in you. Hey, until the day of Christ Jesus, I'm going to be constantly just just showing up and pulling you forward and and moving you down the road. I'm going to be constantly there. Hey, when you fall, my grace is there to pick you back up. When you mess up, my grace is there to stand you back up. When you get all dirty from the world, my grace is there to wash you over and over and over. Over and over again, you see, you guys, this week, this week is the week where Jesus was going to, is is showing us the full extent of his love, pursuing you, rescuing you, carrying you. Oh, how great the love of God. And I love what Paul says. He goes, I need you to do something. I I need you to do what I've done. What do you do? I've become confident in this fact. Oh, confident. So I mean, Paul says, "I, I have come to a place in my life where I have made friends with the fact that God is not gonna quit working on me. 
I, I'm confident. It means, it means I don't fight it. I, 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 I trust it. I'm comfortable with it. I'm no longer wrestling with the fact. I don't, he says, I just am, I am confident in the fact that God is going to keep on keeping on in my life. I'm confident with the fact. Man, I'm, I'm walking around. When the world's telling me, oh, there's no way, and you've messed up, and you're too far gone, and you made the wrong decision, and you, like, I, I'm just confident enough in the, in the grace of God that I could just say that God's got a hold of my life. He's begun to work in my life, and there's nothing in this world that can stop it. Like, plans changing can't stop it. Haters can't stop it. My boss can't stop it. My financial changes can't stop the work of God in my life. Setbacks can't stop the word of God in my life. The change in relationship can't stop the work of God in my life. The things this world throws at me, politics, oh, it's another election year, can't stop the work of God in our lives. Can't stop the building. That, see, God is at work. And Paul said, I just need to get this place where I'm confident. And though I might not always see it and others might doubt it, Paul says, I know it, I choose to believe it, and nothing can shake it. There's no doubt in my mind that God is working. And church, God wants to bring you into that confidence. No matter what the enemy whispers, what others whisper, what your own insecurities whisper, what your emotions tell you, you've got to choose to believe God's voice over every other voice. And God's voice says, I love you, 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 I love you. And I didn't just say it, I showed it. That's what this week is all about. So, Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? Pause with me for a second. What do you say? So, Scripture's going, you got to say something in response to this relentless, magnificent love of God. What do you say? And I love what Scripture is doing here. The Spirit of God is getting you to, to, to someone say, say something. He says, say something. So there's something that happens when you say something. You become responsible to that which you say. You ever talk about, with, how many of you, like with your children, you're trying to, they're at a place in their life where you can now have them clean their room, and you, you're leaving for work, and you get your child and you, you, you get their face and you look in their eyes and say, listen, honey, mommy or daddy, I'm going to work, okay? When I come home, I want you to clean your room, okay? I want your room clean, okay? And then here's what you do. Here's what, come on, good parents, you do this. I want you to say to me what I just said to you. You tell your child, like, like Paul's telling us here, say something, I just told you all this. Now I want you to respond to it. What, what does mom and dad want to have done when you get home? I'll clean my room. Okay, good. Because now I'm going to hold you responsible. It doesn't change. They grow up. They get older. And, and they're, they want, they're leaving for the night. And they, you, got, you put these things called curfews. Okay? And, and pretty soon they're at a spot where... I lived for a long time where I got my two girls and they're running around there trying on 15 different outfits and clothes are flying everywhere because this thing's getting tried on and that. And I'm trying to, hey, everybody, you got to be home. I need you home at a certain time. I don't want you out too late. Here's the thing. And I, I stop all the chaos. I said, everybody, stop what you're doing. Look me in the eyes. What time do I want you home tonight? And I make them say it. 10, 11, whatever it is. Okay, we all agree. We have all come to the conclusion you will be home at 11. Now, if you're not, I'm holding you accountable because you, you said something. So here's what Paul's doing. He's going, okay, 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 wait, everybody. This love of God that is in relentless pursuit of you, this love of God that, that rescues you, this love of God that, that holds you. Paul goes, I need you to say something. I need, you to, I need you to pronounce something. And what is it that we are to pronounce? What, what do we walk out of here saying? Oh, come on, I'm going to change your language today. Because you walked, you walked in going, oh, I don't know, and I'm oh, just messing it all up, and oh, I just, I'm like way off track, and oh, I don't even know if there's any hope anymore, and I, I don't know, like, have you not seen what's been happening at my work? Have you, have you not seen what's happened in my relationship? Have you not, have you not seen, and you're, you're focusing on all these things, and, and I'm here today, but, you're, but it's, it's no coincidence that you're here today, and you're, and you're hearing about the love of God, and you're going to walk out of here instead of going, oh, it's not going to, here's what you say. If God is for us, 
who can be against us? Come on, you got to say it with me. One, two, three. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for me, there's nothing that can stand against me. You see, I walk out of here with a little bit of extra spring in my step. Because God's for me. The creator of heaven and earth is on my side. The creator of heaven and earth is, is got my back. The, the creator of heaven and earth is with me every step. He's in my... And I rest in that. If God is for us, who can be against us? And he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him, graciously give us all things. I lifted the thousand pounds. I could handle the hundred. I gave you Christ. I gave you everything in Christ. I gave you the million dollars, mainly, I gave more than you could ever put it. I gave you that. I could handle your 10 bucks, is what he's saying. You just live with this different sense. Oh, come on, I hear, I hear the religious. Come on, Chris, you can't preach God's grace like that. You can't preach God's love like that. People are going to start doing whatever they want to do. If, if God just loves you no matter what, and God cares for you no matter what, if God, then they're just going to go and they're going to live all sinful lifestyle. They're going to go and just do, no, 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 no. I'm convinced that once you finally let the love of God get a hold of your life, no matter what things you might be struggling with, or what, there's something inside of you that says, oh, God, I just want to love you back. God, I just want to give you my all. God, forgive me for the areas of my life where, where I'm not, the Samaria in me that, that keeps wandering. God, forgive me. And it's his love that brings me back. It's his love that brings me back. His love that remains consistent no matter what. So what do we say to these things? If God be for me, who can be against me? How do we respond to these things? One word, surrender. Hear God. Why try to run from a love that will never cease to keep running after me? Why, why, why try to run? Why? God, you have loved me so perfectly. And I, in response, just want to love back as best I can. God, I'm going all in. We say it around citizens. One of the things we say is he gave his all for us. And therefore, we give our all for him. That's worship, by the way. As the worship team comes up, you guys come out. What is worship? <laughs> worship, listen, worship, watch, look, is when you get a glimpse of how much God loves you. You just get a small, like, remember Pastor Trey talked about that mag the, the, the telescope, you, you, you bring into view that which actually is. The moon is big. God's love is big. And today I just hope I could get out the telescope and go, hey, look at that which is big, bringing the, the vastness of his love up close and personal. When that happens, worship is the response. It's surrender. It's praise. It's, it's, it's out in song on Sunday. And it's and how I live my life on Monday. I worship him when I show up to work on Tuesday. You see, my life is changed because, because he loves me. He's rescued me. He's begun to work in me. And he's gonna complete that work. I just keep showing up over and over and over again. Church, you grateful for God's love today?